Hi, Ella. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Okay, so we can hear each other. I guess now we are co-hosts, right? Uh, you are now a panelist. I just wanted to mention that we have a few attendees right now. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to meet. So which one do you... So I can make one of you host uh, and the other one co-host. Okay, please make uh, SCDC office the host. Okay. And then Sal Caruso will be the co-host. Um, okay. Um, so I guess as a panelist, you can also do all of the, you have permission to do, like to allow people to talk or not talk and all of those things. So oh, yeah. I can only make um, the office the host for now. The okay, other sure. Say as but then, but it's, it should be applying. Okay, then I can, uh, for example, give permission to Sal's uh, account to control the mouse, like the cursor. You can try right now. Okay, let's yeah. try. does it work no i cannot um have him control the cursor i, I just that option is not here there was this little mouse icon uh -huh. um it's not here anymore mm. it was at the beginning uh no no uh, like in general for zoom meetings not on this one oh. So did you share your screen? Yes. So I'm sharing it here, but it just the image is not showing, guys. I understand. I just but you can put up the first one. The yeah, the one that just has lamb cover page. That's all. I just want to make sure we do a dry run. We post the image and make sure that there's the correct image up. Perfect. Yes. Uh, hey, Ella. Yes. Can do you have the option of giving Sal um, the control of the cursor? Do you have the mouse icon? I mean, mm -hmm. but you're not sharing your screen. No, I'm not sharing. Yeah, that's so. not going to work. Okay, wait a minute. Let me see what I can do.
All right, Ella, uh, we figured it out. We should be fine. All right, great. Hi, I love this is Sal Caruso. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. We're going to go ahead and get started here, I guess, after five o'clock. Yes. So, we, yeah, we should wait for a few minutes. For the rest of the gang. Yeah. Now I can speak to you. Okay. You're coming in live, so do you want to mute yourself? Oh. Oh. Did. Uh,
fair enough? Yes. Uh, can you make me, um, because I don't have any control now, so I need your help to um, make some of the city stuff to panelists. Do you know okay. how to do that? Um, so if you uh, go to attendees. Okay. Um, um, do, I, do you want me to invite them? No, 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 you don't need to invite them. If you go to, you can either make me a host again so I can do that um, because I think as a panelist, you can also present, so it should be okay. And then, or if you go to attendees and I will give you the names and you will just make them panelists. If you go under, on, if you click on their name. Sure, just give me the names. Okay. So Rina Brio. Uh, Serena? Rina. No, Rina. Uh, Rina. R -E. Why don't you give the spellings, uh, please? That way it's more clear. Sure. It's R-E-E-N-A. Um, I do not see that name here. Is the username different, probably? No, I can uh, see Rina right now. So. Um, oh, I just saw her. Okay. okay. There she is. And I think I just saw Leslie online as well. Yes. So if you can make Rena um, a panelist. Yes, she's on. And then Gloria Shara, G L O R I A, yes. a oh. panelist. I believe Leslie is already a panelist, so it should be. Gloria is also in. Okay. Great. Thank you. I think that's for now. If I see anyone else, I will. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you. And there was also Leslie Xavier. Is she also a panelist? Yeah, she's in. She's in the panels. Okay, good. Yeah, she's Great. a co-host. Excellent. By the way, hello everyone. Hello. So it's 5-2, I guess we can um, start by introducing ourselves and um, we would have a few minutes until everybody attend. Um, so I would just start, and uh, this is Ella Karachian, uh, the project planner for City of Santa Clara. Working on this project, um, there are also other city staff uh, present at this meeting, uh, including Rina Brio, the planning manager, Gloria Shara, Development Review Officer, and Leslie, um, uh, the Principal Planner working on the precise plan. This uh, community meeting will be led by the applicant to share their proposal, and uh, city staff will be present to observe and record this community input and answer any questions related to zoning code and the general plan. Uh, I will just give you a brief background of the project, the applicant is proposing a mixed use project on a 0.87 acre site located at 906, 930, and 940 Monroe. And these parcels are part of the downtown precise plan, which is now under development. Um, the project as proposed is not consistent with the existing community mixed use general plan designation. Therefore, uh, the project would include general plan amendment and rezoning and re uh, require an involved planning commission and city council review of this project. Um, just a brief um, um, for the next steps uh, after this, after we receive this community feedback today, we are going to uh, seek uh, city council feedback for this project on how do we consider this application in light of the fact that the community process is now under way for the downtown precise plan? And uh, I believe that the applicant is also going to present this project 
uh, for the downtown task force meeting uh, in December or January, I believe. Um, and this would sum up my uh, background information for this project. So I will let the applicant to start their um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sal Caruso. I'm the project architect and working with uh, LAM Partners. Next slide, please. Uh, LAM Partners had produced this, this particular project at 101st Street in Los Altos. It's actually a, uh, a high-end uh, condominium project uh, adjacent to downtown Los Altos. Uh, they use basically uh, very large uh, glazing windows, uh, some beautiful uh, wood, all wood uh, windows, a lot of detail and attention to detail in the project. I invite uh, people who are on this call maybe to drive by this property and take a look for themselves. This is one of those unique situations where the actual finished product looks much more beautiful even than the very nice renderings. So it's worth a uh, drive to Los Altos and take a look at the quality that they've produced in the past. Next slide, please. This is the interior of the same project. On the left-hand side, you'll see sort of the lobby reception, reception area and further beyond the glass doors, you'll see there's one of their community rooms that's also located on the ground floor. To the right on the project is uh, one of the rooftop terraces that helps to foster a sense of community for the residents of the building. These are highly used actually when we went and visited uh, beautiful spaces that overlook the town and give uh, a very inviting uh, and semi-private space for the residents. Next slide, please. This is the project that they executed at 885 Woodside Road in Redwood City. This was the first project sort of in this newer area that was being redeveloped and, and grown. And, uh, this has a little bit heavier architecture, sort of more heavy stonework, et cetera, for that region. Uh, on the lower left corner, you'll see the rooftop uh, terrace, once again, a kind of a hallmark of, of their projects that overlooks uh, the bay. Uh, very beautiful scenery. Next slide, please. This is the same uh, rooftop terrace. Uh, you can see the, the style of architecture that was used here. Uh, and also, Notice the clock on the left on the tower. Uh, I'll come to that uh, later in the slides and explain further the, the significance of the clock in uh, our project. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. This is one of our projects. This is the Los, uh, Los Gatos Opera House on Main Street. On the lower left corner, you'll see this is the original uh, building that uh, we got the project for in uh, 1989, right after the Loma Prieta earthquake. You can see the stucco and part of the facades had crumbled. Um, the picture on the top left-hand corner is an original photograph from 1906 that basically uh, showed the building under construction, the scaffolding was still up. Um, this was the original brick facade and whatnot that was the ultimate product. However, right after it was finished, 1906 earthquake hit and the building facade collapsed completely and was just stuccoed over. Uh, we actually chose to go all the way back to the original 1906 facade in the restoration project, which you'll see on the right hand side as the building stands today. Uh, so we actually went through a lot of forensic analysis on the project by uh, going through and uh, basically going and stripping all the facade materials that were there. We found the original window openings where they were located historically in 1906 and were able to relocate those windows back to their original locations and recreate the facade precisely to what it was in 1906. Next slide, please. This is 410 Lafayette Way here in Santa Clara. The, Upper left corner is the uh, project as we, when we started, uh, there was a, a strange kind of 1950s addition with a seven and a half foot ceiling in a family room on the left hand side of the Victorian that was added in the, I believe in the 1950s. And there was also an equally odd addition to the rear of the structure. We removed both of those additions and went through the historical process uh, with the city of Santa Clara 
and develop the elevation that you see on the lower right hand corner now that is beautifully maintained. We put new foundations on the home and renovated it completely. All of the detailing, the, the turned posts on the front porch, all of the freeze block work, everything that you see here was carefully detailed and uh, uh, reproduced in original redwood uh, all the way through the process. Next slide, please. This is my office building. So uh, actually where I'm sitting right now uh, in approximately this window here, <laughs> right there. Uh, this building uh, was originally from the late 1800s, roughly, we believe 1885 or so. The picture on the left hand side is what we purchased, my wife and I. And when we walked up to the front porch, the lower picture there that you see on the screen, uh, the very dark grayish picture is looking straight up through the front porch ceiling because the roof had completely collapsed and was no longer there. So it was basically one giant sort of opening skylight when we bought the property. But the part that was amazing was that the original uh, dental molding and mold and detail crown around the whole structure was still intact, even though the roof had collapsed. So we used all of the historic detailing and uh, went through and properly restored the whole structure. We worked closely actually uh, with Gloria Shada at the time uh, to uh, go through the architectural review process and did our addition where we, our offices are now housed along with other retail uses and offices. Next slide, please. This is the uh, Frash uh, home in Los Gatos. I think it's at 371 Los Gatos Boulevard. Uh, this was the lead carpenter for Sarah Winchester. Uh, this was his private residence that he built for himself during the crazy uh, Winchester days when the Winchester Mystery House was built. So uh, we found several of her inventions in the home, which was pretty intriguing. On the left-hand side is the structure as we actually got it uh, when we started the project. It was fairly decayed. Most of the detailing, architectural detailing had been covered over. As you can see in the, um, in the left-hand pictures, the wraparound porches had been enclosed and had become uh, additional rooms uh, for uh, its occupants. It had become some form of a uh, group housing project at one point in history. Nevertheless, it just various states of decay. On the right-hand side are the fully restored images of the home with amazing detail. And again, we reproduced all of the details in the original Redwood and with uh, some hard and fast uh, beauty. This particular renovation won first, pl uh, first place amongst our peers with entries from the United States, Canada, and China uh, for uh, most beautiful renovation uh, in those three countries or those three areas. Next slide, please. This is just more of the detailing. You can see on the left-hand picture, which is the front porch, all of that detailing that you see there now uh, had disappeared or had been legend <laughs> over time, unfortunately. And so we painstakingly restored it all using uh, cedar flooring, redwood siding, et cetera, uh, for the porches. The porches were rebuilt as they would have been back in Sarah Winchester's days, actually. Uh, we did not use uh, the modern materials. We actually used, uh, as I said, the, the cedar planking for the floors and then painted them as they would have done also back in that time. We rebuilt the front steps in wood as they would have had as well in that period. And the windows that you see on the right-hand side, the two center windows, those were also reproduced. So all that scroll work that you see, the detail up at those two little windows at the top, all that scroll work was reproduced. This is not original. One of them is original, I should say. One of them was reproduced uh, because it had been destroyed over time. So we have the craftsmen that can do these beautiful details. Next slide, please. And just to show the integrity and for a little bit of a laugh, the the interior of our kitchen uh, won uh, Best Kitchen in Show as well, which brought my wife in enormous amusement considering my culinary skills are limited to the barbecue in the backyard. So she thought it was pretty amusing that we designed a uh, award-winning kitchen. The uh, interiors on the left are just of the same structure of the uh, carpenter for Sarah Winchester. Next slide, please. The project on the right-hand side is the 
uh, Knox Goodrich Building. It's one of two structures left in San Jose that is an original sandstone building. Uh, this was by Levi Goodrich, who was an architect. Uh, this was his offices and his own private building. The lower ground floor of it had actually uh, been destroyed over time. They replaced it with a 1960s uh, steel storefront. The columns were gone, everything had been removed. So we actually found craftsmen to uh, reproduce the detailing of the two columns and the frieze above it, uh, the glass work, and restored the building uh, as it was in 1889. The home on the left, uh, the antebellum style home is, uh, also from 1906. And uh, this structure uh, was restored and was deemed by the Mercury News as the greatest architectural beauty in San Jose. Uh, next slide, please. This is the rear of the same structure on the right-hand side as it is today. On the left, what it was after a 1950s remodel, aluminum windows and bunch of crazy additions to the home that were all stripped away and then painstakingly restored and rebuilt on the right-hand side. Next slide, please. To Santa Clara. This is our former city hall. The detailing, detailing that you see here of what would be considered a classical, either Italianate or Spanish style building, not mission style. This is not a mission structure. It's more of a classical structure. It does have, however, the clay tile roof, but that's also very common in classical buildings. You can see virtually the entire city of Florence has clay tile roofs, so it's a fairly common uh, roofing material for the classical period. On the right-hand side is a uh, clock that we found. This is a, a historic clock. Uh, it's about 50 inches wide, which from this photograph that we see is probably about the size of the original. We can do certainly more research. And, and I actually ask and invite uh, the Downtown Association, the various groups, Reclaiming Downtown, et cetera, to help us on what the dimensions of the original clock were, or at least approximately. Uh, because our hope is that we can actually place uh, a historic clock that is reminiscent of the one that was at the old city hall on our building and bring back part of the, the history that was lost in our city. Uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to sort of rebuild a piece of downtown, uh, not directly copying anything that was here, but to create something that is beautiful and interesting and has a place and has a sense of community and energizes the downtown. And so I'm hoping to work with uh, Rob Mayer and Adam Thompson and a lot of others, Mark Kelsey and the whole group from uh, the downtown groups, uh, downtown committee on the task force and many others to sort of work and do a very special project, a very beautiful project that all of us can be proud of, uh, working closely with the city planning staff and coming up with something that can be what I hope a new benchmark, something that is interesting and intriguing and important for our community. Uh, I've been here myself for about 30 years in town, uh, actually about 33. And uh, Randy that I'm working with on the project, the owner uh, has been investing in Santa Clara since 1999, I think was the first property that they bought here. He developed some of the I think some, see a 400,000 square foot building on Lafayette, 113,000 square foot building on Thompson Road and some other investments here in town. So uh, he's been long-term investing in our community and I'm very excited and proud to be working with him and all of you on this project. Next slide, please. This is another shot of the sort of classical or traditional building of the old city hall that was removed. Next slide, please. This was at a thought in speaking with uh, uh, with uh, Rob Mayer. He had mentioned uh, a beautiful uh, town, uh, Royal Grande, down down south, and sort of that sense of excitement and energy that was created at the pedestrian level, and sort of looking at uh, how that's accomplished. You know, there's many ways, of course, to accomplish this, but one thing that 
seem to be self-evident is that sort of creating almost two rows of tables rather than, rather than just one row squished up against the building, having at least a two table depth, if you will, along the pedestrian way. So it creates a sense of place and interaction amongst people. Obviously now with COVID, it's a whole different story. Uh, so we adjust, of course, to that. But in this particular scenario, uh, I think under normal circumstances would be lively and beautiful and, uh, and attract people to come and be in the downtown again. And also one thing that's important about this slide is that when you see the, uh, the, the brickwork on this, the brickwork is highly detailed. This is not just a bunch of little bricks glued, like thin brick that's half an inch thick glued to the face of a building. This is authentic detailing, has a depth and sincerity and character. And that's, I think, why I wanted to start the presentation with showing some of our past historic projects, because what we're looking for here is authenticity, sincere, authentic buildings that mean something to all of us and not just simply a pretty face or another stucco box. We're looking for something that is meaningful. And if you look at the detail of this building all the way down to the bottom, even the bottom blocks of what appears to be granite there, the gray granite up against, you know, on either side of the doorway. Again, a very strong traditional detail that is done on these older buildings and was lost over time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another building. And what's important about this building is the storefront, right? Because part of the importance of interaction between the street, the streetscape, and the interior of these shops is how do the storefronts read? Are they something that are broad and open and inviting or, or closed off from the community? And obviously we want, we want the broad and open to the community approach. And again, this just shows authenticity of materials and sincerity of forms and, and beauty. Next slide, please. This is a, a traditional storefront. This one was a bit modified because uh, you'll see here it has the TDLs or what were called true divided lights. This was something very likely added uh, in, the, in later days because typically in the traditional storefronts, they had larger pieces of glass uh, that kind of helped showcase the wares that were in those windows. That was very common in the you know, Victorian era in the uh, 1900s, if you will. Next slide, please. Again, this is sort of showing the re-entrant uh, storefront where you, in order to go into the particular space, the doorway is inset, it is not flush at the front facade. Many times on modern uh, retail, you'll just see a flat storefront going across and you'll have a door in it, right? But in the more detailed traditional architecture, these storefronts usually step back and in, usually at 45 degree angles and creates a doorway entrance uh, that is separate from the storefront. So you have what are called, you know, your display windows, and then you have a separate area that is the entry point of the space. So it defines the spaces very well and very rhythmically along the facade. So it makes it easy to read the space and read the building. Next slide, please. So this is our proposed site plan. Before we go into the actual architecture and project, full disclaimer, we're coming to you now in the community meeting because we finally have something to show and something to start, not finish our dialogue on the project, but start the dialogue. So any input that is given is literally given, it received with our full hearts because we want to be able to hear what people have to say on the matter and really incorporate the important features into the project. So this is our launch point uh, to start dialoguing why we're coming to you now. The, um, the main site plan shows, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side is Franklin Street, the bottom is Monroe, and on the left-hand edge is Homestead. The parking for the retail is all along the back of the property uh, and has entrances on both Franklin and Homestead. And all the parking that is required for the retail and restaurant spaces are all located along that back edge. So it makes it easy for people to come in and out of the property. 
all residential parking will be accessed through the ramp that you see on the left hand side here along uh, Homestead. This is the, uh, the main driveway area uh, for the, uh, the ramp that goes down for one level of underground parking that would satisfy all the requirements for the residential uses and actually some of the employees of the, um, of the retail uses and so on, just the employees, guests and uh, visitors of the retail or restaurant space would be using the ground floor parking only. Again, just to make it easy for those that are not familiar with the building, it'll be an easy in and out for them. Very important feature that we have updated since we've have been speaking to some community members is if you see along Monroe, there's uh, tables and chairs. And what we've shown is also the three plaza spaces along the Monroe area. And this is still something that is evolving and changing as we are receiving your inputs and dialogue. But we've showed sort of these reentrant plazas that are somewhat like some of the examples we'll show you in a moment at uh, OPA's in Campbell. Uh, and some other sort of little mini plaza spaces that create people places, right? Places for people to gather and come together and, and have community and enjoy a good meal, enjoy a glass of wine and relax and uh, be part of the community. Again, the desire here is to have an energized street frontage. That's accomplished through a couple of means, design and infrastructure, right? Because good design will help that happen, like the suggestion of a Royal Grande, uh, you know, that sort of interactive space with tables that are at least too in depth along the street frontage. But also other factors, right? Along the street frontage on Monroe, we have operable walls. So we have systems that can open up entirely. Again, similar to OPA's in Campbell, where you can open up and you can have indoor outdoor interaction very easily and seamlessly. But infrastructure is critical. How retail succeeds or fails is based on the infrastructure you place in the building. For example, there are examples in downtown where people have not placed any uh, grease trap, for example, for restaurant usage. The sewer lines are not there to support additional bathrooms and kitchen infrastructure, uh, gas hookups, a lot of different things that need to be in place so that you can rent the spaces viably to restaurants. Here, we have grease trap, we have the sewer lines, we have all the infrastructure that will be built into the project so that you can, if you will, as a restaurant, plug and play. You can come in and start a restaurant without having to spend some outrageous amount. Because when you try to put in hood shafts, for example, if you have a kitchen, you need a hood shaft, which is a class A hood that goes all the way through the building or out the side of the building, one or the other. And that has to be all fire rated and properly lined, et cetera. To do that after you have units built, is virtually impossible. The expense of it would be a quarter of a million dollars just to get your, your hoods exhausted through your building. It's insane. But when we build them into the project from day one, which is our intent here, to build in the hood shafts, build in the uh, grease traps, the sewer lines, et cetera, anyone could come into this and plug into those systems and that infrastructure, and it's already there. It's part of the shell building and not something that a tenant would have to go in and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to do. That's why you probably see some vacant spaces in downtown because those infrastructures were not built, wasn't thought through and they failed. So our intent here is to use good savvy, good business sense and build in that infrastructure from day one and make sure that we have the absolute potential for a successful uh, business. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a little bit of the imaging on the lower right is the Opus Plaza that we were talking about, where it's you know an area where people come together, community. It's lively. It has outdoor lighting, uh, outdoor heaters. You know, a cool space to sort of hang out and be. Uh, the element, the photograph on the left, top left corner, is sort of the idea of the two deep of tables, where you have two rows of tables on the left. You have the sidewalk in the middle, and then you have a park strip, a five foot park strip along the street frontage. So this is kind of good urban planning. A lot of urban planners uh, work with this kind of a format so that when you have a 20 foot wide sidewalk, you have an area that you can use for tables, for interaction. You have an, a, you know, an area for sidewalk walking 
And then you have an area for planting and separation from the street, if you will. So all of that is sort of what is called the streetscape, right? Uh, rather than landscaping, it's streetscape in this particular vernacular. Uh, next slide, please. So when we started, this was the original architecture that we proposed as at least a launch of massing and scale of the project. And we got basically two completely different viewpoints. We got one that said, love it, it's beautiful, it feels uh, like it belongs in Santa Clara because it references a lot of architecture that's in Santa Clara. And then another school of thought that said, no, we want something that feels like it's been here and was built over time as separate buildings. Next slide, please. So we developed kind of a different modeling. This modeling is sort of that philosophy of something that's built over time that has a sense of Santa Clara. We brought back the idea of the Santa Clara sign that was lost uh, in the by the wrecking balls in 19, was it 63, I think, something like that. Uh, and the idea of bringing back some of our deco touch and brickwork and steel, uh, some different materials and features of buildings that were here at one time. So this is more of a notion of something that feels that has been built over time in different periods, more of a downtown scape, if you will, uh, that you would see in many towns uh, throughout California. And uh, this is just, again, a talking point. This is a notion. This is not anything finalized. So please don't take this as a final design, as a final draft, not even close. This is a dialogue starter. Just like the prior design that we had, uh, just like this design that you're looking at at the moment on the screen, uh, what, what I'm asking for from everyone that's participating is give us your thoughts, give us your sincere input. I do realize that there is you know, the downtown uh, task force that is underway. Uh, that will take some time. So what we're looking for is basically allow this project to be something that we work together on and helps to form those thoughts because there's nothing better than a real project to help promote real ideas and real concepts amongst committees and groups is saying, how do we address this? What do we want our downtown to feel like, be like? What references do we want there? Do we want an active sidewalk? Because we've heard both. I mean, our opinion, both as architect and Randy as owner, is we want a very active sidewalk. We want active businesses and retail. And we've heard people say, we don't want any retail in the downtown. So that's the spectrum of opinions, basically from A to Z, which is normal, of course. So what I would like to do in opening up uh, comments from all of you is please tell us what your thoughts are. So obviously, uh, because there's quite a few people on this line, I think there's 82. So we're probably going to have to, in order to be done by seven, where we have an hour and a half. Uh, we'll probably have to do like, um, let's see, sorry, one quick moment. So uh, this is Ella from planning department. Um, I don't see that everyone has raised their hand and so we can, start by allowing people who raise their hand to talk first. Right, I don't right. think that everyone. Um... Right, but I would like for everyone to raise their hands that wishes to speak because then we can have an assessment of how many speakers there are and then we can make sure we divide the time up equally so everyone has the opportunity rather than giving opportunity only to the first and none to the last. So can Sal? I... Yes. Sal, sorry, this is Rena. I just wanna also say that there are, th there are questions that are in the chat and um, I think you should probably figure out whether or not you want to answer some of those questions, maybe scan oh. through them at some point too. Um, you know, I think it is a good strategy to ask people to raise their hands and sure. that maybe you, um, you go through those first, but it might be good for one of your colleagues perhaps to read through some of these questions and see if there's some responses that could be provided through the chat, either live or responding through the chat. I just want to want to alert you to those. Okay. I <laughs> ah. So let me address one of the questions that's on there right now about the the two homes that are on the site currently. Um, so on the two homes, 
the homes are being proposed to be relocated. The, the house at the corner of Homestead and uh, Monroe is historic, the Victorian that is. The exterior is very pretty, the interior is shot. It's been used and abused, unfortunately, for too long. Uh, so it'll have to be fully renovated. And that is being proposed for relocation within the historic quad to 290 Elviso Street. Uh, that's a location within the quad designation, uh, quad area. And the size of the lot is very, very similar to this lot, actually almost identical. And it is a corner lot. So the home would be placed uh, with, if you will, the same orientation. So the short side of the home facing the shorter dimensioned property side and the length of the home, the side of the home would be on the longer side of the property with the exact same orientation. So the corner that it shows right now, the two sides that are to the public face would be the same two sides that are to the public face in the proposed new location. The so, uh, excuse me, this is Gloria Shara. Um, the house that's behind the, um, the, the house that you're referencing, yes. is that going to be moved along with this one? Because they're both on um, the inventory and they both are included in the Mills Act agreement. So even the other one's considered historically significant or just because it was on the same lot? I don't know, I don't remember offhand, but um, it was included in the Mills Act agreement. So there's just, it's one of there's consideration made for that sure. structure as well. And so let's look at it, Gloria. And I, I didn't think the other one was the one that was historically significant, it was the Victorian, but let's, I will double check it and make sure. And if it is historically significant, then it'll be moved with it. Uh, and if it isn't, then we'll have that dialogue and see what the, you know, the thoughts of the community are on it. And we'll go from there for sure. So definitely we'll, we'll, we'll work through it. Thank but you. Excellent, excellent question, Gloria. Excellent. Uh, the red house, the house next door to it is not uh, on, not considered historically significant, is not on the Mills Act, et cetera. But we would like to relocate it nonetheless. And that one, we have a site at 1175 Lafayette Street, which is actually down the street from my office, as a matter of fact. Uh, and these are uh, both properties that are, are owned by the client and uh, are, again, of the approximate size of the existing lots. And it was quite a challenge to find lots within the old quad that are comparable in size and similar in orientation to make them work. But those are the two sites that uh, have been identified for the relocation of the two homes. So they would be relocated, new foundations and fully restored to uh, state architect standards, basically like we have done in the works that you are familiar with that we have done in Santa Clara previously. I think that was one of the significant questions on the chat, most of the, Sal, do you want to start with the people who was raising their hands and then we can address the chat questions? Sure. So we can hear sure. uh, from the community. Sure. Uh, so Farnas, if we can uh, get the, the first. So all comments, how many hands are raised, Farnas? 17. 17, okay, 18. We'll, we'll limit the, the input to two minutes just to allow everyone the opportunity to talk. So uh, Farnas, if you can get us the first speaker, please. Hey, good evening and thanks for sharing all this detail. Uh, I've been pretty actively involved with the downtown planning process. So some of my questions are, um, you know, how much you understand about that process because that's like a key place where the community is sharing their vision and how much are you involved in that? I know providing a clock and uh, signage, that's that's a really like, I would say 2% of restoring the actual downtown that people want. And my second question is looking at the Silicon Sage project, um, because of the fire access along Monroe, there are no trees. So I just wanna make sure what are you doing different in this project that there are trees along Monroe in front of this huge building because like that makes a lot of difference of the scale of the building. Sure. And uh, just a quick comment, like authenticity is a great word to use 
but I think we, I would also want to know how is this authentic to the current times? Like why in 21st century, we really have to build a building from like 1950s or 30s? Like, you know, what is the authenticity for climate change, resiliency, sustainability, like as a millennia, those are my issues. And how are you tackling those? I don't want, you know, a non-sustainable building in my community. May, may I ask you a question, Atisha? Uh, do you prefer a modern building? Is that what you're suggesting? A contemporary I, building? I totally would. I would be one of the person who might buy a condo in downtown to live and raise a family. And I'm not, I'm, I would rather live in a little bit more modern building, which is, yeah. uh, you know, speaking right. of its Fair time, enough. like authentic of its time, Fair uh, enough. than having so, to be forced to live in a building, which is like from my grandma's time. Sure. Um, let me respond then to the questions if you can mute Farnaz and then we go. So Atisha, the authenticity, uh, how do we address authenticity? So the details make all the difference uh, in authenticity. That's why I actually started the presentation showing our past projects to show that it will not be a stucco box uh, like has been represented and unfortunately done up and down the El Camino Real and so many places. So authenticity of detailing, how we make sure it is, I'm putting my name to it. Uh, that's very important to me because I am an architect located right here in the historic quad. I've been here for 21 years. And uh, with my offices here on El Camino Real, I own the only Victorian left, I believe, on El Camino Real, the only historic property or the only historic Victorian left on the entire El Camino from one end to the other in the entire city of Santa Clara. So authenticity is very important to me. Sustainability is also very important to me. I actually built the first LEED Platinum. I'm sure you're familiar with LEED. The first LEED Platinum multifamily project in the state of California. Uh, received a commendation from the governor of California on that many years ago. We led by example. We actually developed several sustainable practices for that project. It was a small project that my wife and I own uh, here in Santa Clara. And we basically did something that was at the time, revolutionary, designing a lead platinum project uh, on our own with our own money. So uh, sustainability is critically important. This project will be designed with sustainable standards and be built as a modern building, meeting all the proper sustainability requirements. As far as, uh, so that's, that is a done deal, not a question any longer, I hope. Uh, as far as uh, design, I appreciate your commentary about uh, you know, modernism and contemporary. I, I, that's part of what I want to hear from everyone tonight is, what do you prefer? Uh, what are you looking for? Because architecture is the exterior face, right? That's what the community sees and interacts with. So that's why it's very important, as Randy actually often says, we design buildings to be four-sided, meaning it's not just a, a fake front on one side facing the street and then the sides are ignored. The building has to be beautiful all the way around it, all four sides. What you see, what a neighbor sees, what the people behind us see, all is critically important. So we're looking forward to designing something that is beautiful and uh, agreeable to the community. Agreeable to the community with a big giant disclaimer or asterisk is obviously if one wants modern and the majority of the community says we want something more traditional, then not everyone will be satisfied and that's a fact of life but we want to design something that the majority of the people will be happy with. That's our goal. Uh, next person, please. Okay. Janet Stevenson, you're online. Yes. Um, Sal, this neighborhood of the old quad, is it's, it's special in, in terms of all of Santa Clara. It's got its own unique look. And that unique look is the charm of those two houses that are sitting right there in the corner. And so those, those houses need to belong and stay right where they're at because they represent the neighborhood. When you rip those houses away, you're taking away that look. And you say you wanted to bring back you know, the historic downtown, but if, when you're taking those houses away, you're ripping away the historic downtown, just like it was ripped away back in 1960s. It's the same thing just happening all over again 60 years later. So I think would be much more clever and much more creative is to keep those homes as is right in their spot and build housing that complements them and doesn't make it look like 
By now, the way you've got the development going, it makes it look like you feel like these houses are in the way and actually makes it feels like the house is behind it. The other vintage homes, historical homes right behind it, that whole neighborhood, that those homes are in the way because this is an overpowering thing. I think a, a beautiful thing was if you can have a, have a development, a housing development that complements those homes, the homes behind it, the home next to it, all of those vintage homes. That is something that would truly be a great legacy. That's, this is a great opportunity for that. This is more of a, this is where the neighborhood is. Now, I know the downtown task force has got its, its own plans. And actually the building that you're kind of proposing might belong more, especially with all the retail, might belong more in the, down, in the task force in the downtown, what they've got going. This particular spot where you're talking about. Janet, sorry to interrupt. You have 30 seconds. Okay, well, this is, there's homes right there. This is the neighborhood right there. The homes need to be emphasized and they need to be cherished and preserved. All right, thank you. So you prefer more traditional design, it sounds like. I prefer that you keep the houses in the same spot and build and build around, build with existing structures in place. But the design to be traditional. Something that complements the, the homes that are there, including the homes that, that you want. Right. To thank you, thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Hi, um, yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my name is Gavin Laurie and I work with Catalyze SV. Um, we are a project advocacy organization that looks at development projects um, in Santa Clara County. Um, and uh, we're really happy to see a development coming in here, see homes um, and, and the mixed use content of it. Um, I just kind of wanted to put our name out there. I know our executive director already put something in the chat, but um, we, we've reviewed a number of projects um, in Santa Clara and we definitely love uh, the opportunity to look at this and bring it to our members. Uh, our members are kind of regionalists. They look at um, everything in the, in the wider community um, and kind of advocate for, for uh, quality design and, and good um, and a lot of housing um, to be brought to this area, which is really needed with the housing crisis. So uh, thank you for, for presenting this project. Um, we're interested to see what everyone else has, uh, the other comments. Um, and would love to, uh, you know, bring it to our project advocacy committee if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. Okay, um, didn't know it was me. So uh, my name's Joya and um, I live right next door to your proposed uh, project. Um, um, I'm 1391 Homestead and my father lives next door, 1399 Homestead. These homes, the one I'm in has been in our family for over a hundred years. So if, my, my problem is, is if we have to move the two houses that are on those on the properties next to me, my main concerns would be privacy. Um, as a building that tall will be looking straight into my house and into my backyard. Um, is there something you can do for that? Like maybe no balconies on the back? Uh, a very large wall. Uh, so yes, that is an excellent point, Joya. Thank you very much for bringing that up. I had forgotten to mention this. On the entire rear portion of the building, what we're doing to make sure that people cannot look down into your backyard is several things. One, any level of balcony or whatnot is set back from the edge of the building a few feet so that no one can look down. Because when you have a railing at the end of a balcony, someone can just go hang out on the railing, if you will, and look straight down into whatever's below, correct? Mm -hmm. By actually thickening that wall, that balcony area by a couple of two, three feet, or recessing the windows far in, the only way you can look is straight out, meaning up and over, you know, you're at a whatever, 20 foot or 30 foot height, looking straight outward and not being able to look downward. So we are strategically designing the rear of this building. We've not shown the details of the design yet, honestly, Joya, just because we haven't gotten to those details yet. But we are 
absolutely incorporating those features. We're putting it here on public record so that people cannot look downward into your yards and make sure that your privacy is absolutely protected. That is critical to us, very important. Thank you for bringing up that point. Next speaker, please. Frank, you're online. Hi, uh, Frank Lemon here. Um, yeah, I was just curious, um, why aren't you waiting for the uh, downtown community task force to complete the precise plan before um, starting the project? Excellent question, Frank. Thank you for asking it. So I have worked on task force in, in, in my career as well. I was uh, on the San Jose Planning Commission when we went through the Evergreen specific plan. I was on the Midtown specific task force with Susan Hammer, uh, worked through a lot of those details and those projects. So I am very familiar. I'm also the former uh, chair of the Planning Commission in San Jose many years ago. Um, and so I'm very familiar with all these processes. And what makes me most familiar with them is the fact that they take several years. They are not um, a fast process. And we do have a project that is viable and under you know, zoning laws is allowed to, to be presented and be submitted and be considered uh, before the decision-making bodies. And that's what we're doing. So it's not that we're trying to not wait for the process, we wanna be part of the process. We wanna be able to allow our project to come through and frankly, create a new benchmark because there's no better way to create a benchmark, Frank, than to have an example saying, this is what we want. And what we're being offered, I, on a personal note, have spoken to the last three mayors of Santa Clara saying, when can we do something about downtown? This city has everything going for it. It has business space, it has Intel, it has beautiful, safe, neighborhoods, it has community, it has a sense of care and involvement, but we lack a downtown. We really do, as we all know, and that's why there's a task force and there's many other groups like, you know, uh, Reclaiming Downtown and the, the Old Quad Association. I mean, many groups, right? All with a singular purpose of doing something beautiful. So what I want to offer is the opportunity to work together to create that beauty, that project that works for our town and and does something special. So uh, I look at this as an opportunity to do it right. Um, next speaker, please. Sal, Sal, do you mind? Hi, sorry, it's Rena. I just wanted to clarify because I think we have people who started the meeting at different times. And I just want everyone to be aware that the proposal includes a general plan amendment that's a legislative action. So the city council would have to amend the general plan to facilitate the proposed development because it's actually within the boundaries of the downtown precise plan. Staff is gonna be asking the city council for feedback on really how do we uh, reconcile the fact that we have a general plan amendment that's being you know, requested to move forward at the same time as the downtown precise plan engagement process. Um, so that's something that we'll be taking to city council in the relatively near time frame. We wanted to get feedback from the community that could feed into that, you know, this community meeting that could feed into that, you know, information sharing with the city council. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I just wanted to share that, you know, the actual application here will go to the city council and we'll actually be taking it pretty shortly to even give some guidance. Um, and just one you know, piece of information, like for instance, our El Camino Real specific plan, um, the city council uh, a few years ago, um, less than a few years ago, a couple of years ago, gave guidance to applicants who were proposing development while that specific plan was underway. So that's something that the city council could provide guidance on or um, you know, provide other feedback as well. So just um, Frank, you know, just wanted to, uh, tag off that question to provide some more information on process. Thank you, Rena. Uh, okay, we have the phone number ending in 9814. Yes, this is Doreen Carlson. Um, Doreen well, Carlson? Yes, hey, Sal. Um, Hi. I, I'm, uh, you know, I saw, you know, your whole presentation and, you know, you had these beautiful, um, historic buildings that you have done uh, even the the um city 
hall, the original city hall. And there's a couple of things. First of all, there's a, there's a really important word, erosion. And even though it looks like you guys do one, this Lamb does some amazing buildings and some of these pictures you're showing show really good quality work, which I really appreciate. We are losing homes. We have lost so many historic homes. The Wells Fargo took down a beautiful mansion and you get that Wells Fargo that's pretty ugly. Um, your first proposed what's on the poster on the corner to me is just you it, the juxtaposition of seeing Michael Cole's old house or whatever the corner house and to see that building is just makes me really nauseous. This other rendering is a lot better because people have to understand this is a historic neighborhood. If they want modern or whatever, they can go to other neighborhoods or maybe that can be incorporated in the downtown farther down the road. But we need to have that continuity and to move these houses is eroding our neighborhoods. We've lost so many homes to apartment buildings in the 60s with the urban renewal. And um, that's why they have the Mills Act to keep these beautiful homes. Aaron, where, you have 30 seconds. Where you're proposing to move the whole house on El Viso would take away from all of us. Monroe is a main, main drag. So I am really against this project so far. And I feel like it's, we're, we're being pulled in at the last minute and didn't really get to give any feedback at the beginning stages of your proposal to hear what the neighbors are. Cause you know, then now we have to work hard to work with city council to, you know. Okay. Uh, the time is over, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you. So Noreen, to address some of your thoughts, uh, there is no last minute. This is the first opportunity we have had in scheduling with planning staff to schedule a community meeting. We are asking to go to the downtown uh, task force. I'm uh, unable to attend the December 17th meeting because of a prior commitment that I'm doing an EIR scoping meeting that same night at the exact same time, coincidentally. So uh, arrangements are being made to come before the downtown task force. I think the earliest they will see us is January 21st. As of today's communication, we had asked if we can have a date in December and that was denied. That's not our preference. We had preferred to go now in December at another date and that was not granted. So nothing is last minute. These are the first minutes. These, this is the inception of the project. This is where we had something to come to you with and start the dialogue process. So. There's no last minute, there's no rush. We are here to do a project that is beautiful and part of the community. And we're opening the doors to communication, not closing them. So quite the opposite. Next speaker, please. Um, we have the phone number 4703. Yes, good afternoon. And who is this? My name is Janine. Janine, okay. Thank you. So I also have questions about the two homes on the corner. Um, and you were talking about moving one to Alviso Street. Um, I what worry about moving, moving one of those houses nearer to the university. We had problems with that in the past and one house got moved and the other stayed um, and moving it over towards the university uh, could quite possibly mean that it becomes a fraternity or a sorority house. And those houses are not usually kept up, certainly not to Mills Act standards. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. And then what would happen to the other house uh, behind the strip mall in order to rotate the other house. I hope I'm being clear. When you say the other house behind the strip mall, which one are you referring to? I'm sorry. You're talking about moving the house on the corner over yes. towards the university. And then from what I understood in your presentation, moving the house closest to the strip mall around the corner and sort of re uh, relocate oh, no, 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 no. 
rotating no, it. The red house, I think, is what you're referring to, right? That's the one. Nearest. I think so. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much for that clarification. That. No, the the red house would not be moved around the corner. Be moved to Lafayette Street, and Lafayette Street. There's a proper full residential lot there, and it would be on a normal residential lot on Lafayette Street. Uh, down near, I guess, the intersection of Benton and Lafayette, somewhere in that zone, if you will, maybe closer to El Camino this way, I believe. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, those would be both both relocated on their own individual specific lots and fully restored to uh, proper historical standards. How, that's, how that happens is basically through the process, right? Because when these are moved, uh, we have moved historic homes, including my office building, including a home right around the corner from my office, another one uh, down on Benton as well. And when we move these homes, uh, they have to be moved and cared for and guaranteed all the way through the process. They have to be restored. The planning department comes and walks the property, at least I'm assuming the practice still remains. They did it with our other projects. They come and inspect the home when it's completed to make sure that it was done, if you will, the right way. In addition, of course, to the building department, making sure that all the structural integrity and all those things are there, right? Because that's through the building department permit process, the inspection process, and then ultimately the planning department comes and assures that it's done to the right standards. There's historical reports that are done pre-move. So the house is then fully inspected, photographed and documented uh, by a historian. Then the new site, has to be evaluated by the historian and the end project, like the configuration of the home, the restoration of the parlor, all these interior spaces also are evaluated by the historian to make sure that it complies with all that. So it's quite a laborious process. It's not a slant, you know, like a snap your finger and done by any long shot of the imagination, like the Thrash House, the Carpenter's House for Sarah Winchester and all these others. These went through very strict and rigorous guidelines by, uh, Department of the State Architect and uh, is very, very well documented and surveyed and inspected all along the way. That's how you get to the right project at the end, if you will, to answer your question, Janine. So this is Ella from Planning Department. I just wanted to mention that um, no historic analysis has been conducted yet, um, and these historic analyses are required to determine the appropriateness of this relocation Correct. request as part of the CEQA review. Um, and we are here all, um, for sure to hear your to also hear your feedback and your concern about moving them or relocation them or, re or relocation or even like keep them at the place. So we are happy to hear your um, feedback. Next speaker, please. We have uh, Suska, I believe, on the line. Hi. Um, what is your name, please? Can you hear me? Yes, what is your name, please? I'm Suska, Suska Varda. Suska Varda, thank you. What is the zoning now and what will need to be changed? Ella, would you like to speak to that? I'm sorry? I was asking Ella, our planner, to speak to that. Sure. Um, the zoning right now, um, so there are three parcels. Um, one of them is the historic combining, HT zoning. One of them is general office for one of the historic houses. And the bigger one is um, community commercial. In order to move forward with this proposal, uh, the applicant has to rezone um, these parcels to plan development zoning. Uh, we have Gracie online. I'm um, sorry, Ella. Can yes. you also just share with people what the current general plan designation is? Um, yeah, so the general plan uh, for all three parcels are community mixed use, uh, which um, allow, uh, let me check for you, uh, which allow 20 to 36 units per acre uh, and a minimum FAR of 1.1 commercial space in conjunction with the res uh, residential development for community mixed use. I mentioned before, the current proposal is not um, consistent. 
with the existing general plan, which is community mixed use. And the applicant has to go through the general plan amendment. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Grace is online. Oh. Hi, my name is Gracie and I live uh, on Franklin Street and I actually have several questions. Um, I'm curious as to if there's been any surveying done on if there's any interest in commercial space um, for retailers. Um, I asked the question because we have the other um, large property that was just opened up in the last couple of years and there none of the retail space there has been filled. Um, with the exception of Orange Theory, all of those lots are vacant. So what will be the difference in this building? Why will this building rent space and that one didn't? Um, in addition to that, what are we thinking about in terms of crosswalk safety and the traffic down Franklin Street? That's where I live. That's where my kid plays outside. Um, and for me to walk across Monroe Street with my toddler, um, we have to worry about getting hit by a car all the time because nobody even bothered after we added all this space to put in a beacon there or any sort of crosswalk light to make it more safe. Um, also the traffic down Franklin Street, we tend to be a little bit of a drag strip right here. So something will need to be done about that as well. Um, and then my last question is how many workers are expected to be on site during the construction of this project and where will they park? Um, with the last project, we had lots of issues with construction parking. It took up our street parking. Um, but in addition to that, the construction workers were not necessarily respectful of our homes. Um, I had to personally call the construction company once uh, because there were men undressing in front of my kitchen window, changing to get in their cars before they left um, to go home. So I'd like for you to address those questions. Please. Thank, you. Thank you, Gracie. Thank you for bringing up those questions. So uh, the, the traffic issues, uh, we will actually have to evaluate through the traffic analysis that will need to be done for the profit, for the project traffic study. And that particular uh, issue if there is a need for uh, whether it's traffic calming measures or other types of things will come up as part of that process and then during that process during that uh, EIR scoping meeting etc the all the comments that are being gathered today and all the comments that come at future meetings will be incorporated and addressed in those documents they are required to be so under CEQA so that will be addressed as far as the uh, the type of retail and why there's vacant spaces next door Next door is actually an example where there is no grease trap. There are not the provisions of infrastructure to support restaurants that are built into the structure. So if you want to stick a restaurant in any one of those spaces, you have to go find a way to get a shaft through the building. I don't think they have shafts. I'm not positive, but I don't think they do. I have heard that they do not have grease trap on property. So that a grease trap just for informational purposes is something that separates grease from water from uh, dishwashing activities in restaurants. So you are required by the sanitary sewer department to have grease traps whenever you have a restaurant. So if you don't have those provisions built into your building uh, for a tenant to come in there is excruciatingly expensive. So we're building those provisions into that infrastructure into our project from day one. So we feel very strongly that there is a great market for quality. Uh, what there is not a market for is when buildings are not prepared to help people have successful businesses. That's unfortunately a lose-lose situation. And Randy has great experiences with retail and great experiences with building successful buildings. And we have been also exposed to many of them over the last three and a half decades. So uh, that's why we've teamed up to create a project that will be successful and will have an energized retail space that serves the immediate community with places that we wanna go and hang out at. Uh, as far as the workers and the, the weird behavior and whatnot that you mentioned, which definitely is a problem, uh, that has to be managed. Uh, I can tell you uh, on our job sites that I've been involved with, we do not tolerate that. We don't even tolerate profanity, which unfortunately in many job sites is considered a signature hallmark. And we have zero tolerance for it because we know that there are families and there are people in the community. My office where I'm at, many hours a day. It's just a couple of blocks away from this location. And this is my neighborhood. This is my community. So um, we won't tolerate that. Uh, you, you should never have to call people to make sure that doesn't happen. That's an unacceptable behavior. People should not be undressing in front of your kitchen window, et cetera. Uh, there's a level of decency that needs to be held to. And uh, I know that in working with Randy, that will be held to. 
on this site. And uh, I think I think those were your questions. Next speaker, please. Uh, we have uh, Johannes Hemp online. Um, yeah, hi. I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, uh, my name is Hans Hampel, and um, we live in the old quad on Franklin Street, um, right in close proximity to this site. Um, I first want to give a shout out to Gracie because the issues she raised are 100% um, true. And I think um, both the developer as well as the city officials would actually do well to, to actually um, take a closer look at um, traffic on Franklin Street, traffic on Monroe, and how pedestrian traffic is managed. And having a big apartment complex like this going in uh, would certainly not alleviate the situation at all. Um, in general, I'm very concerned that uh, you want to move two historic or at least one historic house and one that blends right in um, to make room for a pretty, I don't know, I want to say cookie cutter, pretty standard um, apartment complex. Um, we just had the same thing happen a couple of years ago. Uh, right across the street from Franklin Street, so next door um, on Monroe. Um, I think to me, this is only tolerable if you do this in conjunction with the city's effort to rebuild some sort of downtown, um, where maybe you need to move some of the smaller buildings to actually have some uh, higher rise buildings uh, that would represent something that, that people would recognize as, as a downtown. Uh, so only in context of, of a greater plan uh, to me uh, that, that actually tries to rebuild Santa Clara downtown, um, a proposal like this would be acceptable. Otherwise we'll do just exactly what uh, the folks, the old Santa Clarans in 1960s did and and ripped out downtown and, and put in whatever they put in, which nobody is too happy with, I believe. And that's okay. all I want to say. The time Thank is you. over. Honest, I, just to address that quickly, we have zero interest to do what was done in 1964. I stand by this as a historical preservationist. I, I've dedicated most of my professional career to preserving historic landmarks. And yes, in many instances, moving them because under the state guidelines, they're allowed for both relocation and adaptive reuse. Because sometimes like in my office building, it was a home and it became an office. But that, because it became an office, it was allowed to survive and be part of something bigger and newer on El Camino Real that made sense uh, from an economic standpoint and a functional standpoint, frankly, uh, because El Camino Real is, a good place for an office, not a great place to live if you're on a residence on a single family home on El Camino. Um, so, um, um, yes. Sal, let's, if let's, I could just add, um, yes, to everyone, this is Gloria Shar, the development review officer. Just, so just to mention, um, to give everyone some context and some, uh, maybe alleviate some of the concerns, the relocation of the two houses isn't um, something that's an absolute. And if you just uh, a few doors down is 575 Benton, that's the Prometheus project that was uh, proposed over multiple parcels next to the university. And um, there were a number of historic homes that were evaluated in the environmental impact report. And out of that number, I forget how many, maybe there were seven, two of them were actually retained on site and then the development built around it. So it is possible to incorporate existing properties into the development. If that's the consensus of the community, we definitely want that feedback uh, for consideration. So just let you know that it has been done in the past and it is certainly possible. So just to give everyone, um, you know, just some level of, um, you know, um, information that those options are still on the table. Were the other three homes relocated, Gloria? Or the others, you said seven, so they're five. No, I think um, some of them were, one. another one was relocated and used as an ADU, but it was not determined to be historic. The ones that were historic were significant, uh, historical significance determination based on the city's local criteria um, were retained on site. 
And so in terms of the the red, you know, the one the house with the gambrel roof, I think it's been initially surveyed, but there's when you said that it's not on the inventory, that, that requires a basically a submission by the property owner and then a Department of Parks and Recreation form through the National uh, Park Service evaluation form. So I don't wanna say that it's, we can't make a determination yet because that survey hasn't been completed. It may very well um, be evaluated and found to be consistent with criteria that we have for local designation. So that, that um, determination is still open and, and will happen as part of the environmental review. So we don't know the, really where that one falls. Uh, but the other one, of course, is an HT property, which was a special zoning district that's issued for properties. It has more intense um, scrutiny and evaluation for changes to it. So it has, it's got an, it's, it's a separate zoning classification. It's in the zoning code. People can look it up. And that one has been uh, benefited from the Mills Act for property tax reduction in exchange for preservation on the site. So I know some of the work hasn't been done on the interior, but again, it includes both those properties. So that one does have a determination on it. All right, next speaker, please. We have Carter Flores online. Carter Flores, are you there? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, excellent. Yes, um, I was just uh, wondering, and I just wanted to ask, uh, why is there already uh, floor plans um, before coming to the community? So why, why, why are there floor plans already being drawn up before coming to the community asking for input? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so the the main reason is that there needs to be a point of beginning in any dialogue and in any conversation. So what we're doing is saying, this is what we're initially thinking about. And I come to you, not as someone detached from another city or inexperienced with either historic context or with downtowns. So I come to you as an architect who has worked on this for some 30 plus years. So what we're proposing is something that is to initiate dialogue. Again, as I stated in the beginning of the presentation, this is the starting point. So floor plans are part of it because you can't have massing of a building. You can't have the answer to the question, well, how many units are you proposing if you don't have floor plans? So we needed to generate those floor plans, those preliminary plans in order to look at what is the size of the building? What is its location? How many parking spaces are required? How do we meet the parking standards of the city of Santa Clara, which by the way, we do meet 100% of all the required parking for the city of Santa Clara for the zoning ordinance. So you can't, we can't have a launch point unless we know how many units, how many parking spaces, where are the driveways, where's the access, how tall is the building, et cetera. So we need to at least have a sense of scale and mass to start that dialogue. So we just got that. We were able to schedule this community meeting. So we're coming to the community at the earliest possible time. I wish it was faster. Honestly, I wish we can get before the downtown uh, task force sooner than next January 21st, but that's the date they gave us. So uh, we're coming to you as fast as we can, and we will continue to have an open dialogue with you throughout the process. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you, Sal. Um, this is Gloria um, to everyone again. And just to ta um, taper off of what Sal said, yes, it is a consideration in reviewing the floor plans because there is a general plan amendment proposed and that would change the allowable density on the project. So the current density wouldn't allow this many units. And so for the develop, development team to show the community basically what can be achieved under this revised density if it's approved, then he sh he's illustrating essentially the types of units, the size of the units. It gives the city also a chance to evaluate um, what percentage would be allocated towards affordable housing. So it, it's really a schematic for the community to consider that is the increased density warranted at this location? Um, is the public benefit there in exchange for the change in the land use designation that was previously contemplated under the 2010 general plan. So just to give you a little bit more context. Thank you, Gloria, that, that is very helpful. Yeah, we, we need a launch point to know what we're proposing and what we're coming to you with, so to speak. Uh, next speaker, please. 
We have Jonathan Evans online. Jonathan Evans. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so my name is Jonathan Evans. I'm the current president of the Old Quad Residents Association. Uh, I have a couple comments for myself and also some I've heard from the community. Um, I've had many of our members and other community members come and speak to me about the concerns about moving the historical homes. Uh, I think that, you know, there's been some other people have said very good comments about like uh, along the lines about keeping the homes as is. Um, I don't know if you've considered what I've seen and developed in other cities like Monterey and other places with historic downtowns, which have made um, points to have adaptive reuse and incorporating historic properties um, into future developments. Uh, this also is really important when you're trying to create a downtown or a place to, you know, try to, one of the first things you should do is try to reuse a home um, or a building before you, you know, decide to move it or, or tear it down. I also wanted to comment a little bit about the fact that the Cole House is currently historic combining district um, zoning designation, which was specifically created to preserve historic properties um, rather than have them be moved. So it's it's a little concerning that you know we're looking at rezoning this and, and removing that because you know there's a and that zoning type even requires maintenance contracts to keep the building up um, with the city. Um, so it's it's a it's a really a preservation oriented zoning type, and you know that's something that's really appropriate. And a lot of people in the old quad um, want to support and or believe in, and it's kind of concerning that we, we're getting rid of that. And it's not clear that we actually have to even do any changes to you know. Um, preserve that. Um, and then on the kind of general architecture, um, you know, our architecture, you know, there, there's creating an authentic large building, um, as mentioned, and then Jonathan, sorry to interrupt, you have 30 seconds. And you, you, just because something is like larger or stretched out, you know, doesn't mean that, that it's authentic. You know, a lot of the mission style you see by the university looks pretty terrible because the missions aren't, aren't five stories tall. Um, unfortunately, um, I'm not a huge fan of your office because it's kind of a weird looking Victorian um, in the size it is. It doesn't really look like a Victorian anymore. Um, and we really want to make sure that anything we do build or anything we do in the downtown really fits into the style of the neighborhood. Um, so I'd like to make sure. And then one last question is, what is the timeline of this project? You know, are you going for early consideration? You know, where are you along the design process and, and where can change? Sorry, the time is over. Um, so timeline, we are working through the process and we're working through the, thank you for your comments, by the way. Uh, we are working through the timeline in the process with the city. So we're going through gathering community input and we'll be going before council for their input uh, at some point in the near future. And that'll be obviously publicly noticed as everything is in the community. Uh, so uh, we don't have an established timeline other than we're working through it right now uh, diligently and trying to get as many community meetings. Uh, I'm thankful to several people in the community that have already met with us uh, and we're continuing that process and we'll continue to do so uh, at the best pace we can. Thank you. Next speaker, please. So this is Ella uh, from Planning Department. We are taking this project to council early next year in January or February to give to, give, to receive feedback from council on how to review and continue reviewing this project. Okay. Okay, Next we speaker, have please. Don Drace online. I was at uh, Dan Andrusek. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. This Dan? Okay, great. Dan Andrusek with Reclaiming Our Downtown. How are you? Hey, Dan, how are you? Um, there's been six attempts to bring back the downtown. This is a unique one in that we have never had a precise plan or a downtown citizen task force. Um, these guys are charted with getting the citizens' input and, um, and then, you know, constructing a precise plan from that. Um, Sal, you're an architect. You wouldn't start construction on one room of a house until you've completed the plan of the entire house. Um, what we're doing here is we're starting a building before we've completed the the plan for the downtown. So. You know, I and many of the group take exception to that. I think it's, you know, that's, that's not the way to go. Um, and, and one, you know, one example of that is the sign that, you know, we put up there, you know, our, our teams have been working on, on putting a sign like that in the center of town. And this is an example of if somebody goes off on their own without the 
citizen's input, you know, you can have duplications, you can have mistakes as far as the retail entrance way on, on what the downtown task force has determined is, you know, what the citizens want. So that's why we want you to wait for the precise plan. It's not going to take seven years. Um, and, uh, and then follow, follow those guidelines. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so, uh, in uh, in response to the uh, the sign and the Santa Clara sign, et cetera, this is basically a suggestion. And if the public input comes back saying we don't want it on this building, we don't want the clock on this building, not a problem. Uh, we can work with that. This is trying to bring back something because in an idealistic situation one can dictate by a precise plan saying, I want to sign in a clock in this location. It may or may not happen, meaning in the future, there could be a future developer that is unwilling to incorporate certain things. And I'm not sure how, uh, how those things can be forced, if you will, uh, even through a precise plan uh, mandating such things. So here you have a developer and an architect who is willing and open to incorporating beautiful features that are part of our heritage and our town. So I would say, consider that option at least. Uh, if you say no, and the community says, absolutely not, we don't want it here, forget it, then we will remove it. But know that you are given the opportunity to participate in an open dialogue and you have a developer who's 100% open to input and an architect who's 100% open to input. And I guess yours and the community's is the decision on whether or not to take advantage of that. And, and really work with us collaboratively and, and work as a team to make something beautiful for our city. I've been dying to do something beautiful in Santa Clara for a long time, and this is a great opportunity, and I hope you guys see it as an opportunity uh, as well. Thank you, next speaker. Uh, Sal, before the next speaker, this is Gloria Shara again. Yes, Gloria. Uh, just, just, uh, just to mention the process for the El Camino Real specific plan. At the time, the city did not adopt, or the city council did not issue a moratorium to not um, submit applications, development applications, for properties on the El Camino Real. But they did. Um, indicate we had a number of property projects in the pipeline and the council decided that essentially we would not um, entertain or review or be favorably uh, or they would not favorably reconsider projects that would be um, heard in it prior to the completion of the visioning for the El Camino Real. So um, that took I think about 18 months maybe Leslie can comment on that but that was the direction that council gave and we're still going to go forward to council to um, you know get that feedback as well but that's what happened during that specific plan process so right now we're very early in the downtown process so just to give everyone some information regarding another specific plan that that's what occurred with, with that with el camino real specific plan gloria this is leslie you're correct Next speaker, please. We have um, Bob O'Keefe online. Hi, right, thank you. Um, thank you, City, and thank you, Sal, for putting this on. Uh, my first question would be, who is actually running this meeting? Is this a city meeting, or is this uh, by, by Sal and the developer? Well, this uh, is the applicant's meeting. So. It's supposed to be our meeting as a community meeting, applicant's meeting, yes. Okay, thank you, because it seems like the city has got a lot of input on this, which I was kind of concerned about. But um, secondly, uh, Bob, sorry, this is Rena. Hi, I'm Rena. Rena, planning manager, for those of you, I know many of you, but I know some of you don't know me. Um, this is a requirement that the applicant host a meeting. We are present and we're panelists because we're actually controlling the Zoom webinar so that we can make sure that people who have their hands raised are getting they're quite, you know, they're getting called on. We're providing sort of like transparency and we're here to hear input and talk about process. That's what the city's role is, but it's really about Sal to present the application and to get that community feedback that we're recording and we're taking down. But this is only, this is being done as part of a city requirement, but it is not a city sponsored meeting per se. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rena, for making that distinction. Now, now I'll get in my questions. Um, first of all, I, I agree with most of the other speakers and, and I'm looking on the on the web chat also. Uh, I, I do not believe those two historic homes should be moved. Uh, we've been talking about rebuilding downtown, how terrible it was to tear down these buildings. If this new downtown is to happen, which I believe and hope it will, somebody came in and said, we're going to tear down that post office. Will we let that happen? The answer would be no. Uh, these two houses have been there longer than the downtown has been there, so they should stay too. They can be repurposed into something. Uh, just because somebody comes in and buys a piece of property doesn't mean that the city has to rezone it or do a general plan amendment to make that happen. Uh, buildings can happen around it. It was mentioned about the Viso property uh, with the historic house there. But most importantly, I want to talk, which I just found out tonight, uh, one of these houses is going to be dropped at 290 Alviso Street. Um, Mr. Crusoe, Sal, you and I have had some discussions on some properties around there before. The last one you mentioned earlier was 410 Lafayette Way. Well, we have house. 30 seconds. Thank you. Beautiful house, how you designed it. It came out well, but that turned into a um, sorority house, which we all knew was going to be. But you said at the time that, well, we don't know. It might not be, but it did. Um, again, beautiful house. But this lot that you're planning to drop it there, 290 Alviso Street, that will never work. I want the houses to remain where they are. And I can guarantee you one thing, the neighbors down here and the citizens will not let our city council have that house placed at 290 Alviso Street. Thank you. The time is over. Thank you. All right, um, next speaker, please. And before we go to the next speaker, I just wanna clarify on uh, the 14 Lafayette Way, the owners did convey to me in all sincerity that they were not sure what to do with the property. So I conveyed the best information that was available to me uh, from my client. And that's what I said in all honesty and sincerity. So that is a simple fact of, of record. Uh, and it is a beautiful home and it is preserved beautifully. And thank God it'll be around for the next probably 200 years and did not fall into further decay as it was. Uh, next speaker, please. We have Anthony Karnesica, if I'm right. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, Sal, I'd like to thank you for doing this meeting. I know it's tough to face the community with the first meeting. Sure. Um, I heard you mention that this is gonna be plumbed for restaurants and I think that that's great, but um, I do have some concerns about that, especially when across the street, the retail is vacant has been, has been mentioned, but um, do you have any incentives that you're gonna be offering restaurants to bring them in or um, especially during the pandemic when restaurants are closing across the country and especially in our area, um, it's gonna be hard to really fill that space. And I know that this project is gonna take a while, maybe a year and a half, two years, but um, are you gonna be offering anything to really try and bring restaurants to the community to build the old quad area that you're kind of talking about you envision for the area? Absolutely. I want some great places to hang out with as well in the, in the old quad. Um, the owner I know has been in contact with uh, several businesses, local Santa Clara businesses that he's looking to have them into this space uh, because it will be beautiful space that'll support Santa Clara businesses. So he's already well underway in offering the spaces to local businesses because that's really our number one goal is to make sure that local businesses that might be uh, pushed out of existing spaces for redevelopment purposes, whatever their case might be, and they'll have a home here uh, where they can still maintain and be part of the community. Uh, I think that's absolutely critical. So I know the owner is working hard on that. That's not my end, that's his end of the business, if you will, uh, in looking at retail uh, leasing, et cetera. So yes, it is being done. And uh, thank you, Anthony, for the question. Next speaker, please. We have Mike Walkie. Mike. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I'd like to comment that uh, I really appreciate you coming to the community and reaching out so we get some good input from everybody. Thank you. And um, there are some things and some hurdles, obviously, that, we, that need to be overcome and worked out with the community at large. Obviously, the two buildings being moved is a big hurdle. Um, I would like to see you work with the Reclaim Our Downtown group, get some input from them. But overall, I appreciate you and the developer coming to the community, 
as a first step to, to get this kicked off so we, so that we as a community do have input. Thank you. Absolutely, that, that is our goal. This is a first step in one of many, not, not a last step. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Rob Mayer. Hi, Rob. Hi, Sal. Um, could you put the original proposal that you had on the screen? Just, sure. Prior just, slide, please. Just for full disclosure, I want to let the attendees know that I did meet with Sal and Randy Lamb uh, through Zoom last Wednesday, and we had about an hour discussion. And architecturally speaking, when I looked at this image, it felt very much like uh, a lot of the streets where we've torn the bungalows down and we've made more of a monolithic building, like in our city, a lot of apartment buildings. And I, I don't think it had the rhythm, the vertical rhythm that you get of storefronts in a lot of old downtowns. So after that meeting, you know, the next photo is what you're seeing. Uh, the I next think photo, please. Sal took some of my, my comments. So let's go to the, the one that you're where you vertically have buildings that look like they could have been built by a separate property owner over time. Somewhere in there is what creates the dynamic and the organic nature of downtowns. And Atisha hit on it too. Sometimes you can do modern built in where one was torn down and something was put in between two buildings. Um, so that was what I was trying to convey with my meeting with Sal. Um, you know, the style is up for conversation. The other thing is the historic houses. You know, sometimes as architects, Sal, you know, I do my best designs when people put more uh, hurdles in the way. And Rob, sorry to interrupt. We have 30 minutes. Three seconds. Yeah. Seconds, sorry. <laughs> that I would be great, that, huh? <laughs> okay. So, I think that you need to work around those historic buildings because those are two of the last vestiges of our old downtown. Um, and sidewalks, you know, I think you should put the trees in bulb out so that the sidewalk doesn't get pushed in and this will thereby allow more seating against the building. And the reason why there's failure in retail is there's very lim limited outdoor space that's not designed in properly for outdoor seating. Right, the time is over. More than, I can have a few more seconds. Um, yeah, please go ahead and finish up, Rob, because you're addressing some of the good points. More outdoor space is what's lacking in a lot of these buildings. The Silicon Sage product doesn't have a lot of seating space outside. That coupled with grease, lack of grease traps, you know, what's working in pre-COVID and, and hopefully post-COVID is food, food services, drink right. services. So, you know, I'm, that's just to the other people uh, that, you know, maybe don't understand that element. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next speaker, please. We have Lucy Harrow online. Lucy. Hi. Welcome. Hi. So um, I'm actually directly impacted by this development as it butts up to my property. Um, I'm completely opposed in having the two historical homes moved. I think it changes the fabric of our community and our block. And I do feel that this development isn't a good fit for our block, to be honest with you. I think it's too big in its size and scope, too many units. I don't like the balconies on the rear uh, looking into my property. So um, I do have a lot of issues with this. Um, I think the only question I have for you is I wanna know if these condos are due to be owner occupied or are they considered rental units? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, Lucy. I want to reiterate a point I made earlier is that the project is being designed to not look down into the adjacent properties. So that is uh, a non-issue from our point. It's a very important issue, but we are addressing it directly and head on. Uh, so that won't be an issue for you. Uh, the, uh, the question that you had, um, I apologize. Ella, what was the question that she asked, just asked? Oh, these rental or rental ownership? Units. We actually, uh, I don't know yet. I, uh, the owners are still doing their performas and looking at what's going on. I think the market will, will dictate part of that because we're in a COVID situation. So they're not sure how the performa will work if it's ownership or if it's rental. Uh, so 
uh, we don't, I don't have an answer on that yet. I'm sure it'll come down the road, but not yet. But thank you for the question. So we'll keep that as a, a live question uh, for the future. Uh, next speaker, please. Donna West is online. Donna West. Donna, are you there? Donna? Hi. Hi. Yes. There you are. Yes, hi. Um, Thank you for your question. comments on chat too as well. I've been reading them as we go. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I'm helping reclaiming our downtown as a business historian and have done oh, great. lots of research from the 1940s and th you know, 30s through the 60s and until now. And I, I saw this development go up. Well, it was before, but the first I saw it go up was last summer. Our, I was uh, I found it and it was under preview. Um, Which development are you referring to, Lucy? Yours, Adana? yours. Oh, ours, okay. The Thank Monroe. You. It's like Monroe I've been project. watching it. I've been watching it through this past year, and I know you bought that property what, or a year or so ago. Um, I'm waiting wondering why did you wait until the elections to finally present this to our group reclaiming our downtown in the old quad uh, elections have nothing to do with any of the timing just as a full disclosure on the matter this is purely a matter that we needed to work through as i mentioned earlier uh, floor plans massing scale number of units parking go through that process before we can present anything. Uh, the properties were purchased over time. I'm not sure exactly when Randy closed on all the different properties, but it took quite a bit of time to aggregate the properties. And we started our design process promptly and we're just trying to get at least something that could convey message and initiate dialogue. So we've not waited at all to reach out to the community. We have reached out to the community now that we have a form of dialogue and you can see just in one week's time from my initial meeting with, uh, with Rob uh, Mayer and other persons, you know, giving suggestions about creating more of a vertical effect on architecture, more of an established downtown, et cetera, that we're evolving the design immediately. So this is a live document, if you will. These drawings, these designs are alive and flexible and evolving. Uh, there's nothing stagnant and there's nothing old about it. We're creating them as we go with community input and that community input has just begun and will continue throughout the process but thank you for your thoughtful comments donna i understand i understand so uh next speaker please andrew fong andrew fong hi hi sorry it's actually becca fung um okay. <laughs> i couldn't figure out how to change my husband's um name so um I, so as someone currently in the process of putting together my application for the Mills Act for our home, um, I guess I'm just concerned and I live on Main Street across from the um, Mission Library, so pretty close to this oh. area. Um, I'm just concerned about the preservation of the neighborhood and I'm a younger individual. I haven't, I've only lived in Santa Clara for about five years, but I love it um, and I love the historic areas and I'm just concerned what the value is of the preservation of using the historic designations in the Mills Act if these houses can be moved out of the way for development. Um, and I completely appreciate the ability to have more dining options, especially to walk to, um, all of that. Um, I'm just wondering why we don't make the current non-historic newer building areas better rather than trying to get it right over and over with taking away older homes and re um, replacing them with, you know, supposedly better retail and better, you know, obviously I think this is, um, this would be great in some ways, but I am really concerned about moving those homes. Sure. And so I guess my question is, are you open to keeping those homes where they are um, and redoing um, something with that in, in the plans. I, I think that, you know, thank you for your question, Becca. I think we're, we're taking all inputs tonight to seeing uh, what the community is looking for. And we've spoken also to a lot of people in the community that are very supportive of the moves of the homes. 
as well. So it really just, you know, it, it's a matter of choices really on the project. And I think that I am, I am hopeful that the community will see this as I do, that this is an opportunity uh, to create something beautiful and, and work together. So we're just going to work through the process and listen attentively, Becca, to you and Donna and Lucy and Rob and Adam and Mark and all the other individuals that we've uh, spoken to and are speaking to uh, consistently uh, through the process. So thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Skip Pearson. Skip Pearson. Can you hear us, Skip? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Sounds like a Verizon okay. commercial. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> uh, I really love what you're doing, the idea of uh, spending that kind of money on developing the westerly end of downtown. I think it will uh, be a real spur to the development of uh, of uh, building downtown a lot sooner than all of us uh, think. I understand the privacy uh, concerns of the immediate neighbors. I think we all do. But downtown's very small. It's only 10 blocks and it goes to Madison by that's part of the specific plan that the uh, task force is now considering um, uh, what kind of form, what kind of formula we want to use to build downtown. And I'm part of uh, Rod. So I think it's really uh, interesting about the Victorians. I think as long as you're willing to move them and keep them in the old quad, and as I understand it, to, uh, to restore them, I think that's uh, that's a great idea, and I I know even more lots in Old Quad if you need any more. Um, I did have one, and I I love the idea of, of what you were talking about earlier, Sal, with the and didn't storefronts and the broad uh, sidewalks, twenty foot wide sidewalks, and the um, uh, open storefronts and the indented storefronts, and 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 at least two table depth for the. Uh, in front of uh, restaurant type stores, uh, even more would be better. The, um, I did have one question though. For the yeah. top, is there any plan to have a rooftop community area, a rooftop park, if you will, maybe um, a gathering spot for the community on the rooftop? Well, what, what we do have planned for, or at least proposed for the building is a rooftop community space for the residents. Uh, that would be, I believe it's about, I want to say 3,500 square feet of space for the community as a whole uh, up there, which is quite large as a, as a terrace, a rooftop terrace. And we thought it'd be a great place to hang out and you know, watch the parade come by through downtown and have a viewing deck up there, which would be pretty cool. So, uh, so yes, we do have a proposal for that. Thank you, Skip. We have Jeff Houston. Jeff. Jeff Houston. Can you hear us, Jeff? Hello. Hi. Mr. Crusoe, thank you for increasing the housing in our community. We need housing. Our children were raised here, but they cannot afford to buy a home here. More housing will keep our families together. That being said, I lean towards keeping historical homes in place. I have two questions for you. Yes. One, what is the profit margin for the project as proposed? Two, what is the profit margin if the historical houses are not moved? Um, so I don't know what the profit margin is. I mean, in all honesty and sincerity as an architect, that is not our gamut to, to look at. Uh, I know that in doing a project that is high quality and not a cement box, like we have experienced, unfortunately, scarring the Santa Clara landscape um, is very expensive to do. So uh, that would automatically decrease the alleged uh, profit margins because you're spending a lot of money in creating authenticity you know, all wood windows, because this project is designed with all wood windows, which is pretty rare in modern developments. They usually use the cheapy mill guard, you know, plastic uh, 
fiberglass windows pretty consistently, I would say, all up and down the El Camino. Uh, but this is being proposed with all wood windows, clad, aluminum clad wood windows, so the all wood interiors, so beautiful product, expensive. So uh, I don't have an answer to you. Obviously, uh, the project's viability is based upon uh, the performer that the owners are doing, and I, I am not, that, that's usually not my, uh, within my perspective to know, but I can certainly assure you that a project that is being built of high quality materials, beauty and durable quality uh, is much less profitable because you're spending a lot of money on your, your shell and not just your shell, all the projects that Randy has done and the projects that I have done as an architect uh, in this caliber and range uh, are much more expensive to build because not just outside, but inside must reflect the beauty and character, just like Randy's uh, project in Los Altos. Uh, it's super high quality inside and out every space you go into. So they're not as profitable, but they're something that we can be proud of. And that's what we're looking for. Thank you for your question, Jeff. We Next have uh, Jeanne Barkas. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh. The name. <laughs> Oh, hello, that's right. Uh, this is Mark Rogers. Um, so I just, Maya, thanks Sal for this uh, conversation. And my question actually was just uh, re-asked, but I guess I'll just give a quick comment. Um, we're in alignment as residents of the old quad um, with many of the other people in the chat and the comments that our main concern is with moving those historical homes, especially the home on the corner um the green home i think that says you know welcome to the area when you cross the street there it's kind of a corner home statement home that says you're in the old quad and we think that's an important uh landmark and so um i guess we'd echo the the feedback of if there's a way to convert that into commercial or maintain that that home maybe a compromise you keep that home but move the red home i'm not sure but um, we are simply uh, wanting to echo that, um, my family, and that we would like to see that happen if possible. And thank you for your time and your taking the community's input. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. I appreciate it. Uh, next speaker, please. Brandon Frederick. It's you. Oh. Hi. Actually, this is Rebecca Frederick, um, <laughs> but I'm on, I'm here listening with my husband. I was going to say, um, Brendan, your voice is really high pitched. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are actually owners in the, um, the downtown gateway building next door to your proposal. Um, okay. So I just was curious, um, and I'm, I haven't been able to hear the entire presentation, but I'm curious how you are planning to handle the commercial parking area versus the residential parking area. Well, sure. Um, I know in our building, we've had a lot of issues with um, break-ins and homeless, uh, vagrancy, graffiti, things like that. I, I think contributed largely to poor design um, oh. in the kind of the shared space. So can you address that? Sorry, uh, yes. So um, the, can we go to our site plan please, Farnas? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So a couple of things that we're doing that are different than next door. Uh, first of all, uh, we are proposing and we've had inputs back and forth from different neighborhood folks. Uh, we're proposing uh, rolling gates that close all of the commercial parking, which is on the ground floor uh, after hours. So after all the business is closed, the gates will automatically close so that there cannot be any vagrancy and hanging out, if you will, after hours in this area, which I know is a problem in your property because I've seen it with my own eyes. Secondly, look at the line of the space. I don't know if my cursor is visible, but if you follow the bottom edge, Karnaz, uh, of the parking layout all the way across and down and over, the parking is basically all uh, with a smooth line. There are no concealed pockets or corners where people can hang out and or camp out because I have walked, I have seen on your property that there have been little mini encampments like sort of nestled in little corners in this area. Secondly, the underground parking access, which is off of Homestead, Farnaz, if you can highlight that area, uh, show that area, that access point, no, no, for the residential. That's the residential access. 
that also has a security gate with a remote so that the residents can open and close that directly. Your project is designed where anybody can drive into your underground area, into that first area of visitor parking, which creates a potential public nuisance, frankly. I mean, you have an area there that is unprotected and visible and accessible to all. And what we're creating here is like we do in many cities all over is a safe, secure zone, not just for the residents, but for its visitors and for the neighborhood and the next door neighbors and for the community. Because when we create something that is secure and safe for the residents, we've done the same for our next door neighbors. And this is in my neighborhood. So I am concerned and I wanna make sure that it is safe and effective. So thank you, uh, Rebecca, for bringing that up. Uh, and it, very good point. It, it's, it's about design. It's about how you design the space. You are correct. And how we make sure that there are no hidden corners and that there are secure spaces. Very good point. Thank you. Eric Jensen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Eric, I can hear you. Hi, um, I'm a resident. I live just on the street from this proposed site. And I Which just street, if I may ask? Monroe. Monroe. Thank um, you. And I just wanted to provide a couple of comments. Sure. Um, first, th on the on the business side, the types of businesses that I feel like would move into this type of property are not local businesses. Um, next door, Orange Theory Fitness is the only person or company to have moved in to that site. And I don't see local businesses moving into this type of building. And I think um, especially past the pandemic and the impact of it, I fear that it's, it's, it's only gonna be worse for those most vulnerable businesses that are small and local. On the type of housing, um, Santa Clara celebrates itself for its diversity. Um, and based off of the occupancy of this type of structure, I fear that it's not increasing the right type of housing. I love the idea of high density, especially in downtowns, but I don't think that this is inviting a diverse array of residents into that area. And then um, on, the, on the safety perspective that you just mentioned, um, I, I feel like community safety is not achieved by building walls and gates and security gates around premises. I feel like downtown belongs to the people, not to gated communities. And I feel like a, a better solution is to invite the community in and make it part of the downtown, like across Monroe Street. Um, versus creating more uh, barricades and gated communities on the opposite side. Um, I agree with other people on the historic houses. Um, Eric, you have 15 I, seconds. I feel like the idea of replacing historic houses with clocks and um, Santa Clara signs is not a is not an equal substitute. So thank you. And I hope that you treat this meeting as real feedback and not just um, a requirement for an application. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so a couple of different things. This type of housing is exactly what invites diversity into a community because right now this is the type of housing that is very limited and almost non-existent in the downtown core. The downtown core really has just single family residential for the most part. And this represents only the second project being proposed uh, with uh, a little bit higher density and uh, multifamily uh, tenancy, which does invite younger families, new people, retired people, different, different spectrums of people, all different ethnicities, et cetera. Uh, this is exactly the type of project that invites diversity into community. So I do disagree uh, uh, with that last comment made. Uh, by providing new and diverse housing types that automatically invites uh, diversity into a community. If we make everything a standard single family home, then we will only have one type of user and a community is made up of many different types of housing, many different types of retail, et cetera. And uh, to the point of bringing in uh, local businesses and excellent businesses. Uh, I trust very much so that Randy will do exactly that in working with the people he's working with. And I, I know some of them, he's had preliminary conversations with local businesses. So I, I trust that he is working with the right people and he'll do a great job at it. Um, and I think that was the two points made. 
Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for your, your comments. Uh, next speaker, please. Patricia Lung. Patricia Lung, I think. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. How are you? Great. Um, so my name is Patricia Lung. I am the current chair of Historical Landmarks Commission. Tonight, I'm making comments on my own and uh, not off the commission. So for me personally, uh, preserving the fabric of the neighborhood is really important. Um, it's actually like the, and like an earlier comment to say like, you know, the corner house is a statement house. And the, you know, as I walk the neighborhood, it, it actually announces like the historical neighborhood to me, uh, that house and also the, um, the ADU who is, which is also a contributing feature like of the house. It's concerning to me that we need to, we're looking at rezoning to remove like a specific historic property protection uh, <laughs> in order to remove a property that is part of the fabric of the neighborhood. So that's, um, you know, it's, it is a concern. Um, and then another thing about, um, I was thinking about architecture. Um, the, the way I think about like new builds like in this neighborhood is that you want architecture that's complementary to the neighborhood, not necessarily copy and pasting features to other for like from like a historical context and then stretching it out and skinning a big box. Um, so that's something to consider. I'm not going to render like an opinion on specifically what I need from it, but um, something to think about. Um, and then about Patricia, like the resource there is space is being... 30 seconds. Thank you. If I, if I just finish this last thought on the retail rental part, um, the, one of the reasons why the spots are not filled is because the, the rent rental rate is too high on that new building. And it's not really feasible for somebody to go in to rent it. It would be really nice if you have a retail spaces that has financial incentives for local businesses to go in. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Patricia. Next speaker, please. Cheryl Walsh. Cheryl Walsh. Hi, Sal. Hi. Uh, good evening, Sal. And thank you so much. I just want to, you know, thank you for doing this meeting and listening to the community and taking input from everybody. I think if you've gotten close to the number of pages that I've written down of comments and notes, you're a writing lot. a book. You're <laughs> writing a book. Um, you know, uh, just like Rod, though, I had seen the original um, structure. Uh, the, the original facade, which was much different than the second one. And I, what I liked about the second one that you redesigned after you met with Rod is that it did kind of have that nostalgic feel. The second one where, it, it, not this one, but the other, yeah, it has that nostalgic retro feel, but still keeping some modern clean lines to it. And, uh, you know, and listening to some of, you know, the reclaiming of the downtown, you know, that I, I don't know, I just kind of feel like that reminds me personally of more of a, a downtown kind of feel, but uh, you know, and again, no, you know, I just appreciate the fact that you're listening to the voices and you're taking everything into consideration. And you know, from what I know of you, I know that you know you you care about the community. So um, thank you, and yeah, I like this. I like the direction it's going, and thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker, please. Gabby online. Gabby? Hi. Yeah, hi, it's Gabby Seagrave. I live in the old quad area on Santa Clara Street. And uh, I appreciate you taking uh, comments and listening. Um, someone posted a, um, a this reclaiming our downtown had posted the notice of development proposal. And I'm not sure if you are connected in that way, but if you've seen there's like 167 comments and a majority of them seem to be negative, um, mostly I think for moving the, the historical homes. And I, I know you've already heard several people say why and, and especially the one green corner house. Um, but I know some of these people aren't gonna be the type of people that are gonna attend the meeting and make comments. So I, I wanted to bring that, that there are a lot of negative comments, especially about moving those homes. Um, and someone in the chat mentioned that this would probably be a good project if it were moved across the street to where the bakery was leaving those historical homes and, and actually placing it into where the actual downtown footprint is 
primarily going to be developed. So that's my main set of comments. But thank you for your time and, and uh, being patient with us. But you're very welcome. And I, I'm sorry when Wilson's bakery did close because that was my favorite spot to go to in the morning. So uh, hopefully they'll come back. <laughs> thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Oh, um, OK. So let me uh, just bring up this um, issue. We have Brian Goldenberg online, but uh, I guess you're using an older version of Zoom. So it does not allow me to let you speak. Uh, if you could type in your input, we would greatly appreciate it. Actually, Brian, Brian should be able to speak right now. I just um, promote oh, the panelists and talk. Hey, Brian, <laughs> hi. You'll need to unmute yourself, Make sure Brian. You Make sure you unmute. In the lower right. left corner. There you yeah. go. Hi, Brian, please go ahead. Yes, um, well, I want to say that, uh, well, first of all, I'm a lifelong Santa Clara and I lived in the city for 50 plus years. And uh, um, I'm excited about the general framework of the project. Um, I think it's going to be uh, something that can help provide a destination uh, that we really need, uh, a destination point. And also, um, I like the fact that it adds housing and, and the retail. Uh, also, I see the potential for it to be used um, for the, like you mentioned, the parade uh, festivals and other opportunities where, uh, you know, the building can be a part of, of those events. Um, and it could be something where, where people get excited about that they know that there's something happening in that area and it's going to draw people from other parts of the, uh, of the valley. Um, so I think that'll be a nice benefit um, as opposed to people going to, you know, other cities all the time. Um, they can incorporate Santa Clara into their, their, uh, their entertainment and dining, uh, you know, um, uh, opportunities. So um, I look forward to this uh, going forward and, and seeing what can be possible with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. So it looks like there are no new speakers. Uh, there's Noreen and Atisha who had already spoken. Um, and Adam. Okay, Adam has not spoken yet. So let's please go to Adam. Yeah, he's on. Adam, are you there? Hello, everyone. This is Adam Thompson. Hi, Adam. We can hear you. A couple things, Sal. Um, thank you for hosting this meeting. I did meet with the developer actually about a year and a half ago when they first started to uh, purchase some property and ask kind of where we were headed. And, you know, there was concern on my part, and I conveyed it to Randy. I don't believe he's on tonight, but that moving the two houses was definitely going to be something that was going to be questionable to say the least, if not insurmountable. Um, so I think that needs to be addressed for sure. Um, also, you know, we've been talking at the, about the zoning, the downtown, and we have a downtown zone um, and Gloria will speak to this. Adam, did you mute? I'm designing whatever ones, you know, whatever fits on a lot and I, railing it through. Sorry, you hear me? You blanked out for a while. Oh, uh, I, I was talking about zoning. We've been talking about it on the downtown community task force about having a specific zone for the downtown to 10 blocks and that the community has been opposed to using PD in the past in the old quad because it really doesn't take into account any um, consideration for the historical nature of the neighborhood. Um, I would like to know how the historical preservation ordinance does play to this project and the relocation of the two homes. Um, I'll speak really brief. I am a construction, uh, commercial constru uh, construction manager 
for a major company, and I've been in the industry a long time, I can tell you that there are, the, the gateway project is a horribly built project, um, you know, from a construction standpoint. It's, you know, not what we want. I'm hoping, you know, it seems like you guys are proposing a, a more quality project, but you can't really compare the two. Um, the other thing is, Eric had talked about it, um, the retail, which, you know, the retail do didn't survive because they didn't put uh, grease ducts and grease traps in uh, for restaurant use. So it's really limited on what they can and can't use. And that, you know, I think we, I mentioned on Monday, you know, doing a work live, if you are going to sell these, it would be really great to be able to sell the, a unit with a commercial unit so that a local business owner can control their own destiny so that they can buy their house with their place of business and run it and be protected on, you know, having a fixed payment um, for a long period of time. I think that'd be really good. And we've seen that even within the downtown that the local owners have been more willing to work with, um, you know, local business owners than major developers. So it would be nice to Excuse see- Excuse me, the time is over. Okay. Um, so Adam- the, the, I have one, I, I mean, I have one more thing. So, and that's just, you know, I hope we can continue on with collaborating. I mean, you're in a, you're in a, pre a precarious situation where you're in a catch-22, where you have to propose something in order to get it started. But unfortunately, what has been proposed has kind of ignited a firestorm within the community. And I think we need to kind of... Adam, you blanked out again. And start getting it to a place that's more palatable and... Um, you know, with this community. We've seen bad, we've seen good, but we want great. So please work with us. Thank you. I, you don't even have to ask Adam. Thank you for your comments. 100% we want great. And I'm going on the public record with it. We want great also, and very happy, very open to work with you and the community to get to great. I don't want anything less. Randy doesn't want anything else than great. So we're in this together. And I thank you for your input because it's on point and we got to do this. We want to make this something, you know, beautiful for everyone, the city planners, our council, our community, our residents, our next door neighbors, and all of us that uh, spend our hours in Santa Clara. Uh, are there any new speakers for us? Um, Anyone that is not Oh, spoken? we have, yes. We have Adalbert. Okay. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> hey, hi. Um, I'm, uh, I'm resident behind the downtown gateway actually at uh, 1059 Madison Street. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big building and we are right uh, behind it. And this building is towering, uh, you know, our property and the neighbor property uh, properties. And, um, you know, what you're proposing is, is pretty huge i mean it's big there are four full stories plus a fifth uh, sort of i don't know what that is but uh, uh you know i'm sure you did your your homework and uh, due diligence and you you certainly know that uh downtown gateway has a big pushback from the community because of the size of the project they cut down on the top story uh, so it's ended up by being three uh, stories plus a half a third story um, and uh, and no balconies in the back, right? And they even uh, had to push the building back to be uh, away from the from the uh, from the you know properties behind it. So right. I'm just wondering why would you why would you come to the community, uh, you know, with this proposal, which is uh, you know coming up with balconies in the back, a full four, a fourth story, and uh, not like you know taking into consideration what was already uh, uh, something that was communicated for the previous project. And uh, when you when you uh, you know uh, you mentioned those uh, some sort of offset for the balcony is not to look down, I I really don't know how would you do that. Uh, you know it's uh, defying well, physics laws I think. But um, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> pretty much my feedback. And I'm not opposed to the developments. You know I just uh, think they need to be reasonable and they need to preserve privacy because from a residential area with you know lands and small houses we ending up with uh, big buildings and there is a clear uh, privacy issue right and uh, i you know i support lucy who is living just behind and uh, and others because it's 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 really a big change and uh, needs to be taken into consideration thank you for your comments a little bit so uh, to answer your questions uh we did do our research and our due diligence and um it is not 
physics, but actually geometry on how we get the views not to be into the backyards. We can illustrate this with sight lines. Once we get further down, once we have a building shell formalized and established, we'll show you the studies that actually show mathematically that you can't look down. And that's done through what are called sight lines, basically how you create a recess pocket for the window so that the window looks straight out and doesn't look down. Not just the balconies, but the windows themselves. So that's all defined by architecture and geometry. And yes, that's something that can be proven and shown to the satisfaction of the adjacent neighbors so we can make sure that the privacy is maintained. And that is absolutely essential to us, very important to us. So yes, we have studied the neighborhood. We have studied the projects around us to understand what is good, what is bad, what works, what doesn't work, and try to do something as uh, Adam very well stated, we wanna do something great here. And great means not invading people's privacy in my book. And I think you will agree with that, Adobert, Lucy, and others in the neighborhood. And that is our goal. Any other new speakers? Sure, we have a one with the name Galaxy S9 Plus. That's a great name. <laughs> so Galaxy X9 S Plus. Okay, uh, can you hear us? Hello? Okay. Uh, if you can hear us, maybe you need to unmute. You have to hit your unmute yeah. button. They are unmute. They are unmuted? Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Can anyone online hear us, hear them? Uh, Ella, can you do anything on your end to see if you can patch them in? I see. I think Adam has already talked, but his his hand is still raised. I think Atisha wants to. No, the question her. is, the, Ella. The question is, is we have a speaker, a new speaker, and I'm asking if you can do anything to patch them in. Uh, Farnaz, they're identified as what you said, Galaxy. Galaxy S9, and I, they are already unmuted. Okay. They're unmuted, but we can't hear them. Oh. I don't know, maybe. Yeah. I don't see any problem. So we should be able to hear that person. Um, okay, it might be a technical failure on the other side. It might be a microphone failure or something like that that we cannot control. I'm sorry to whomever it is. If you have access to be able to type in your comment on the chat, that'd be fantastic. My email address is also openly available there on public record and is part of the project sign, et cetera. So please feel free to uh, send your comments directly to me, copying the city. Uh, please let me know what your comments and thoughts are, please. Okay. Um, so normally we allow everyone to speak once. Uh, maybe we can do like a minute if, uh, Adam, you have a wrap up comment uh, since we are actually well beyond our two hours. Yeah, sorry. I just had one thing I, I forgot to mention and that was at the end of this meeting, is it possible for Sal yourself to post kind of your list of notes and staff to post your list of notes so that they're community, community um, accessible? And the reason I asked that is because over the years we've been to a this community has been a lot of meetings with developers and a lot of things get said but only a few things get heard and it'd be nice just to have it on record so that way we're all on the same page working forward together thank you have a great evening thank you adam so uh, i just wanted to mention that this meeting has been recorded and it will be uh, available online perfect excellent that should satisfy and have an accurate record beautiful thank you ella for that Yeah. Since um, this is Rena, mm -hmm. since um, you let Adam go, Atisha has been waiting too to just get another chance. She's the only person still left. Can okay. you, Atisha? You have one minute if you could, please. Great. I I just wanted to thank the staff for being so clear about the process. Like that was really clear where this project is heading. I do support density and more housing because you know being a millennial and I cannot afford 
to buy something in Silicon Valley or Santa Clara. So definitely adding housing numbers, I support. And so definitely the second facade is, you know, is is way better than the first one. So I just wanted to let, I don't oh, think so. I you. noticed the second one through the thank presentation you. so well, mm -hmm. but the second one is definitely much better than the first one. So thank Rob, you. good talk to you. I know you're giving a lot of free consultancy <laughs> being on DCTF, but this is, this is going in a better direction. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank I just want to repeat one question did not get answered was like, I want to make sure that we have trees on Monroe. Uh, Silicon Sage does not have because the fire access just did not let anything. So make sure that the due diligence with the fire department is done early on that we can get the public realm we want with the trees, sidewalks, you know, people sitting outdoors, you know, all that yeah. good okay. things we want in the downtown. Those are, Thank you. those are excellent points, Atisha. Yes, we will work with the Department of Public Works in conjunction with the fire department to see what they will allow us to do and, and hopefully they'll give some leeway. And I think there's creative approaches on how these things can be done. I mean, communities throughout California are doing it. And I think it's time Santa Clara also do it and allow for street trees and other things to beautify our communities and our neighborhoods. It simply just allows for a more livable environment. And I'm not sure why they're taking a pretty hard stance against it. Uh, so uh, hopefully maybe with your community support, Atisha and others to to really lobby for that and how we can work together as a community to bring about that change. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else, Farnaz or Ella, that you see? No, we don't have anyone here. Seeing none, we're at none. 20. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Ella, Gloria, Leslie, Rena, uh, everyone. Uh, from the planning department that I can see, I only can see a limited amount on my screen. <laughs> I think Farnaz has much more on her screen. Uh, thank you to the community uh, for excellent input and guidance uh, that will all be considered and is part of the public record, which is very important so that we are not just accountable, but will thoughtfully consider all the different uh, comments that have been put in there. And I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to several of you for asking for and desiring the, uh, the collaboration, because that's exactly what I want. So thank you for those of you who are open and wanting to collaborate to create, as Adam said, and, and Rob also reflected uh, as well, uh, a great project uh, in this location. So uh, looking forward to working with you and uh, continuing a thoughtful process with planning department, city staff, and, and the community. So thank you all very much. Now. Yes. Can I just ask the attendees one um, one favor, which is I'm glad all of you have heard about the meeting today, and that means you got the either the mailed notice or maybe you got some information about social that was posted on the city's social media or on the city's web page and um, events calendar. And um, if just so that you know, if you didn't actually get an email about the meeting through an emailed notice. Um, that is a way for us to continue to give you communication more frequently rather than just public hearing notices that are mailed, which we'll continue to do for those purposes. But um, Ella, if you can maybe uh, type in your email address in the chat, um, that way if you are, have participated today and you didn't get an email notification um, and you want to be added, we would like to communicate with you so you get those kind of project updates and information, but we just want to make sure we get your email addresses. So um, you can you can send Ella an email. And I think Ella, I think people registered for this webinar, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully we'll be able to pull that list down too and people won't mind it being spam. It'll only be related to and if we can, and if we can also be copied on the list of all the participants, because we'd love to also include them in our future communications and community meetings and make sure that everyone is thoughtfully included, please. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank sure. you, Rima. Thank you. All right. Anything else from anyone from a staff side? Any other comments or thoughts before we close out? Uh, Sal, this is Gloria. I just want to mention that there were a few comments made in the chat about be noticed for the downtown um, uh, precise plan. So if anyone's interested in, they're not specifically receiving individual notices, please let us know, send that to Ella and we can get that to the right person so we can get you signed up. 
All right, excellent, yeah. And um, all right, anything else? Excellent, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think Ella, you're controlling closing out the meeting, correct? Um, yeah, we can just leave. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your time.